Yo, 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 what up with it, listeners? How the fuck are ya? Hope you're well. I'm not. I've been incredibly sick. You might still be able to hear it in my voice. In my voice. (laughs) Um, Yeah, apologies for the delay in your regularly scheduled podcasting. Uh, Jack and I both got quite ill been off work for like several days one of our workmates came to work ill and then infected all of us we're all just like (laughs) we're all fucking (laughs) sniffly and fucking dying but i got there in the end i finally got this one done i just had to wait because i was like i can't record and talk like this i can't be like doing a podcast and going and then this happened but (laughs) but anyway we're better now we're all good few little announcements um we met up with the uh sexy british motherfuckers over at robots for eyes just the other day did our crossover episode which i am now editing it's gonna take um probably a couple days to get it all sorted but that'll be out there so keep an eye out for that they also joined us for a special bonus patreon episode so that'll be coming out for our patrons if you're not a patron go jump on it help us out we sponsor a kid so you help us do that and you help pay for this show so you get to feel good about helping us and the kid win-win um jump on itunes and facebook and that and leave us a positive review um tell a friend if you want some stickers hit us up we just sent a bunch out and everyone all these cunts got their stickers now so that's pretty dope i feel like i had something important i was supposed to say and that's why i was doing this recording but i can't think of it so whatever let's get on with the episode shall we love yous bye He was raised in the land down under, where a man thinks on his feet, speaks with his fists, and lives by his wits. Two beers, all right? One for me, one for me, mate. A legendary figure about to encounter a world more treacherous than any he has ever known. Good day. Big down deep from Australia. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I just came down for a couple of days. Probably see you around. Fine. This is your first trip to New York. First trip anywhere. Well, we might just have to give you one for free. <laughs> yeah. One what? How are you finding New York? A bit of a lunatic or something. That's why I love it, because I fit right in. G'day. Hello. Sorry. G'day. Look. Oh. 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 My back! Well, if you can manage, Walt, I'd like to stay a while. Wouldn't have anything to do with a certain lady writer, would it? Paramount Pictures presents... Your pal, Senor Meek. Paul Hogan. Um, hey, my man, what's happening? Uh, where? As Crocodile Dundee. You got a light, buddy? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And your wallet. He's got a knife. <laughs> a knife? That's a knife. Crocodile Dundee. Oh, shot fire! Officer down! Shot fire! Officer down! Got a city officer down! Shot fire! Shot fire on your life! I'm not gonna step the street off! Oh, shit! What are you trapped? Can't throw your trapped? I'm 
Interrupt our program to bring you this important message. You're listening to Carousel Sniper Victim, a Dead Glass Design production, with your host, Sean Jeffrey. Love or hate the movie, I'd say almost every Australian knows of the Crocodile Dundee franchise. It somehow became a cultural guidepost for how the rest of the world sees Outback Australia. But not as many people, I would imagine, have heard of Crocodile Harry. Arvid Blumenthal a Latvian-born soldier who made a name for himself hunting crocodiles, digging for opals and searching for women's underpants, supposedly, in the Australian outback. Arvid Blumenthal, reportedly christened a baron, if you believe the first of his many tall tales that he would tell, was born in the medieval village of Dundaga, Latvia, on the 19th of March, 1925. In 1942, he joined the Nazi-occupied Latvian forces on the Eastern Front, sustaining serious injuries and even being captured by American troops at one stage. After the war, Arvid emigrated to Australia, again forced to flee after defecting, if you listen to his account anyway, and he took up an occupation that was perhaps even more dangerous hunting crocodiles in Outback Australia. Having arrived down under in 1951, he began poaching crocodiles in far north Queensland in 1956. Legend has it that Crocodile Harry, as he would become known, killed as many as 40,000 crocodiles throughout the Northern Territory and Queensland. He would sell the flesh for cash over his two-decade-long career, before giving up the poaching game to retire to an underground cave in Central Australia. The unique town of Coober Pedy builds itself as the opal mining capital of the world, and Crocodile Harry became Gemstone Harry when he moved there to Fossick for Opals in 1975. Located about 850 k's, 530 miles north of Adelaide, conditions are so idiotically harsh to exist in that Cooper Pedy's buildings are actually carved into caves beneath the Earth's surface. And the word eccentric doesn't even begin to describe the characters that you'll find living there. Sadly, Crocodile Harry died in 2006, aged 80, but his spirit lives on. Firstly, a crocodile statue in his hometown, and secondly, his underground home in Cooper Pedy, which is now a museum to one of the Outback's most colourful characters. Found just west of the town on the 17 mile road, Crocodile Harry's underground nest is open every day between 9am and 12pm and 2pm and 6pm and the price of admission is just a $7 contribution to an honesty box. Now Latvians who admire their countrymen will proudly tell you that Arvid Blumenthal aka Crocodile Harry provided the inspiration for Paul Hogan's iconic Mick Dundee character in the enormously successful Crocodile Dundee film franchise. But Alas, as Daryl Kerrigan so eloquently put it in another Australian classic, The Castle, you can tell the Latvians they're dreaming. Australians who've done their research will instead point to Rod Ansell as the true inspiration to the legend of Mick Dundee. 
Now, not to steal all the thunder from Crocodile Harry and the Latvians, though, they do have one certified Australian Hollywood credential. Crocodile Harry's underground lair in Cooper Pedy made an appearance in the 1985 film Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, another iconic Australian movie franchise, but even the dystopian, apocalyptic scenes that were depicted in Mad Max barely scratched the surface when compared to the strange, outback rambling story that is the tale of Rod Ansell. A decade before the Hollywood sensation of Crocodile Dundee exported the Australian outback to the rest of the world, Rod Ansell grabbed headlines in his home country by surviving a 56-day ordeal in the harsh outback Australian bush. What followed were interviews with the press, book deals, television coverage, a very popular movie franchise, and eventually, a crazed descent into paranoia, ending in a deadly shootout with Australian Territorial Police. Rod Ansell was born in Mergen, Queensland, to George William Ansell and Eva May Ansell, the third of four children. It was a fairly uneventful childhood by what limited accounts there are, and at the age of 15, he moved to the Northern Territory. Now, the Northern Territory of Australia covers one million 349,129 square kilometres, or around 521,000 square miles, making it the third largest Australian federal division and the 11th largest country subdivision in the world. It is sparsely populated though, with a population of only around 246,000 making it the least populous of Australia's six states and two territories, with fewer than half as many people as Tasmania. It's a remote, dangerous place to want to work on the land. As a young man, Ansel made a living hunting feral water buffalo in the top end of Australia, the meat being exported from the Northern Territory to foreign markets. In May 1977, at the age of 23. Shortly after completing a buffalo catching job in Kununurra in Western Australia, Ansel decided to travel to the Victoria River on what he claimed was a, quote, fishing trip. He would later admit that he was actually poaching crocodiles, which, I mean, you could argue is a kind of fishing. He was not specific about his plans, and he only told his then girlfriend Lorraine that he would be back in a few months. And now, what happens from here on in is, according to Rod Ansell's own story, and as you'll come to hear, he loves to tell a tall tale. Whilst on this, quote, fishing trip, Ansel's motorboat was capsized and sunk by, quote, something big. He sensationally later claimed that it was a whale. Psh, psh, fucking, what? Righto, mate. What is true, though, is no one knew where to find him. Ansel managed to board his tender, a small dinghy with only a single oar, and retrieve his two eight-week-old bull terrier dogs, and a small amount of equipment, a rifle, a knife, some canned food and bedding. But with no fresh water, Ansel was in a pretty shit situation. Stranded almost 200 kilometers or 120 miles from the nearest permanent human settlement. Worse still, one of his poor puppos had a broken leg.
During the night, Ansel's dinghy drifted out to sea, eventually washing up on a small island at the mouth of the Fitzmaurice River, north of the Victoria River. Over the next 48 hours, Ansel travelled up the Fitzmaurice on tidal flows, becoming severely dehydrated, but he did eventually find fresh water above the saltwater tidal range. Ansel subsisted on wild cattle and buffalo, hunting by day to feed himself and his dogs. He sometimes resorted to drinking cattle blood as a substitute for water. He was also able to follow bees to their hive to retrieve honey. During the night, Ansel slept in a tree fork out of reach of the saltwater crocodiles. Although apparently, he shared the makeshift dwelling with a brown tree snake. At one point, he shot a 5 metre, 16 foot crocodile whose head he kept as a souvenir. And so, his survival journey continued. Ansel never counted on being rescued. He had told others that he would be away for months, and even if any search parties were looking, they'd be combing over in the area of the Victoria River, not the Fitzmaurice River where he now found himself. He rested his hope on walking over land to a pastoral station when the wet season began. One day, Ansel heard the distinctive tinkling of horse bells, which drew him to two Aboriginal stockmen and their cattle manager, Luke McCall. Although he was somewhat emaciated, Ansel was otherwise healthy. Once back home, he apparently kept his seven-week ordeal to himself, fearing he would upset his mother with his recklessness. He later claimed the experience was hardly a big deal. He explained it away as, quote, All the blokes up in this country who work with cattle, ringers, stockmen, bull catchers, whatever, all of them have really narrow shaves all the time. But they never talk about it. I think the opinion is that if you come through in one piece and you're still alive, then nothing else really matters. It's like you go out shooting a kangaroo. You don't come back and say, ah, oh, fuck, I missed by half an inch. You either got him or you didn't. So that's how I looked at it. Until the paper got a hold of the story and, well, that changed a lot of things. End quote. Local papers did see Ansel's story as a big deal, however, and he was soon dubbed, quote, the modern-day Robinson Crusoe by the Australian press. It wasn't long before Ansel had offers coming his way, eventually reenacting his tale of survival in a 1979 documentary, To Fight the Wild, and he co-authored a book of the same name. It was his appearance on Sydney's Parkinson TV show in 1981, though, that birthed the idea for a movie that would include many of Ansel's more colourful traits. Ansel was, for one, known for not wearing shoes, and he only wore a pair of flip-flops or thongs when he boarded the plane to Sydney because the flight attendant said it was a requirement. The ticket taker mentioned germs or hygiene or something, Ansel recalled in an interview with People magazine. I said, I bet the bottom of my feet are a lot cleaner than the bottom of his shoes. I watch where I walk. Reports of Ansel opting to sleep on the floor instead of the bed in his luxury hotel suite and being fascinated by the room's bidet caught the ear of actor and writer Paul Hogan, who then set to work on a screenplay. Hogan's resulting fish-out-of-water storyline about a rough crocodile hunter from the outback that travels to the big city and encounters one city slicker scenario after another, scored with the audiences. And Crocodile Dundee raked in $328 million at the box office. His name is Crocodile Dundee. Good night. Now, he's leaving the outback. Welcome to Los Angeles. For the jungle. So why a third Crocodile Dundee? Why not? This is something that was your idea to Paramount come to you? No. Or? Paramount came to me for many years after the uh, second one to do a third or a fourth or whatever. But I didn't have any interest and I didn't feel any 
any reason to sort of revive the character. But then I went to live in LA for a couple of years and when I left I looked back upon it and couldn't resist the urge of bringing him out of the bush and sticking him into LA. Well, uh, Paul came up with a good idea and you know after he did the second one everyone said, oh you gotta make a third one or a fourth one. And I said, no I really don't know where I can take this character. I think, you know, I'm finished and then he must be on Australian Outback time because <laughs> something like 13, 14 years later, he came up with an idea for a third one. Welcome. When Crocodile Dundee premiered, Rod Ansell, his wife and their two sons, were living on a remote piece of land nearly 10 miles from the nearest phone. So going to a theatre to see the film wasn't even a possibility. But the news did eventually get back to Ansel. Quote, When Dundee came out, people started ringing me up and saying they saw all these similarities between my experience and that movie. End quote. Ansel didn't pay it much attention until a few years later, when he and a friend attempted to start a tourism business on his piece of land, and thought that billing it as the home of the quote, real life crocodile Dundee would be a great marketing idea. Unfortunately, Hogan's office disagreed and denied his letter asking for permission and threatened legal action if he moved forward. The rejection along with Alienation from his peers caused by his time in the spotlight was getting to Ansel mentally. He unsuccessfully took Hogan to court over the issue, which only deepened his financial hardships. In 1985, Ansel borrowed money and secured a pastoral lease in northern Arnhem Land. He started up Melaleuca a cattle station 140 kilometres or around 90 miles east of Darwin, near Kakadu National Park. It was named after the Melaleuca paperbark trees which are dotted all around the landscape. The Ansels built their homestead on the station, not far from the Mary River. In the 1980s, Ansel again found himself in a protracted dispute, this time with the Northern Territory government. It was over the controversial bovine brucellosis and tuberculosis eradication campaign, or BTEC. Essentially, the government was in the midst of trying to eradicate some bovine related diseases. And so to comply with BTEC, Ansel was forced to kill 3,000 head of feral buffalo on his property. Now he had originally planned to capture and domesticate the animals, creating a sort of pastoral herd that would have afforded his family a fairly comfortable lifestyle. He argued that the money spent on the BTEC program would, quote, be better spent on AIDS research, end quote. Ansel considered the destruction of the animals an outrageous waste of good livestock. Three neighbouring graziers were even eventually awarded a hundred grand in government loans, but Ansel was never compensated anything for his losses. And then, Mimosa pigra reared its ugly head. A type of destructive invasive weed. It began taking over the entire floodplain, rendering it useless. With no money to fight the invasive weeds, the Ansels were forced to sell their cattle station in June of 1991. The couple's 15-year marriage soon disintegrated and the Ansels divorced. In June of 1996, Rod Ansel began dating a woman by the name of Cherie Hewson. But depressed, unemployed and strapped for cash, Ansel was beginning to lose his grip. He first began growing marijuana in an attempt to substitute some income. And then he started using amphetamines. Ultimately, the unusual and turbulent life of Rod Ansel came to a tragic end in August of 1999, when his destructive drug abuse and increasingly erratic nature 
led to a shootout that would leave him and a young police sergeant dead. Experienced Territory Police officers. They all broke down on the side of the Stewart Highway the day that Officer Glenn Hewitson was shot dead in a gun battle with Rod Ansel. To quote a Herald Sun article, it was like a scene from a cops and robbers movie, but nobody won. Ansel was deranged and wired on speed. His crazed life came to an end on the 3rd of August, 1999, but not before he had gunned down a police officer, leaving two young children to grow up without a father. Quote, The only verbal communication I had with the gunman was when I was reloading the shotgun for the first time. A surviving officer who has never spoken openly about the ordeal said in a statement to the media. He continued, I called out to him to put his weapon down, and he called back, you're all dead, end quote. Northern Territory Police say they lost an all-round good bloke that day. Sergeant Hewitson's family was robbed of so much more, though. In 1994, Sergeant Hewitson had been commended for bravery after arresting a knife-wielding drunk man who was also armed with a star picket and a billy of boiling water. This was at a community near Alice Springs. He also received a Valor Award after he talked a delusional man, Wayne Coston, who had tried to hijack a tourist coach with a sawn-off 22 rifle into dropping the weapon before he tackled him to the ground at Litchfield Park in February 1999. Six months later, Sergeant Hewitson, aged 37, was killed shot dead by Rod Ansel. His then infant daughter Ruby and five-year-old son Joseph grew up without their dad. And his widow, Lisa, took home her husband's posthumous Australian bravery medal, along with a shattered family and a broken heart. All of the chaos began when Ansel wounded two men on a shooting spree in Darwin and then fled into the bush, raving mad on the night of the 2nd of August, 1999. He was convinced that members of the Freemasons had kidnapped his sons, Callum, then aged 20, and Sean, aged 18. His girlfriend, Cherie Hewson, had told him that as a child, she had witnessed the sacrifice of young girls that her family, members of the secret medieval fraternity, quote, brought out of the woods. They were bound, raped, and slaughtered. The shared paranoias came to a head when Miss Hewson claimed that she spotted three bow hunters dressed in camouflage with night vision goggles near their bush camp. Northern Territory coroner Dick Wallace would later say that, quote, this wretched drivel was the root of Ansel's madness, end quote. After the couple visited mates Stephen Robinson and his partner Leanne Musgrave on a property at Noonamah, about 50 k's or 30 miles just south of Darwin, Ansel started the chaos by firing six shots at their caravan located on Kentish Road. Resident David Hobden jumped in his truck, armed with his double barrel shoddy and went to investigate what the fuck was going on. He lost an eye when Ansel put a bullet through the windscreen of his truck. Hobden ran to alert his neighbour, Brian Williams, who understandably was pretty shocked at the state of his friend's face and so grabbed a baseball bat. He charged at Ansel, who was trying to steal Mr Hobden's truck. Quote, I smacked him straight down the forehead and that's when he blew my hand off. He was going on about 
stealing his children and Freemasons and being a baby killer. Just, mate, he was fucking mad, eh? End quote. Ansel continued to fire more shots at the Williams house. Then, he ran away. His rifle in one hand and Mr Hobden's shotgun in the other. Miss Hewson disappeared before the police shootout and some feared that she may have committed suicide. At about 11pm, the Territory Response Group, the TRG, sent two troop carriers with about six officers in each to set up a command post. They manned the north roadblock. Adelaide River Police Station boss Sergeant Hewitson and his second in charge, Senior Constable O'Brien, guarded the south cordon at the corner of Old Boyney Road. They had with them each a pistol, one 12 gauge shotgun, and a standard issue police 308 rifle. About 10.30 a.m. the next day, a removals worker named Jonathan Anthonese was leaning on the cop car, just casually chatting to the officers. You know, how crazy is this whole man on the loose and wanted, ha ha, when a bullet blew a hole the size of a baseball in his pelvis. Jonathan Anthonese was flung forward, screaming and landed in a heap on the road. Mr Anthonese's colleague, a man by the name of Tony, who was actually David Hobden's brother, the guy who lost an eye the night before. Small towns in outback fucking Australia. Everyone knows everyone. So Tony dragged Mr Anthonese out of view as Senior Constable O'Brien covered them both. The shots were coming from light scrub behind a roadside water pipe. Ansel had snuck through the bush and was hidden in the shadows of the twisting scrub. In his statement, Senior Constable O'Brien said, quote, I heard Glenn shout out, get on the ground. I turned around and looked over the boot of the car with my Glock drawn. I saw the shots hit the ground close to where Ansel was. End quote. Sergeant Hewitson, meanwhile, was calling the TRG for help and grabbed the 12-gauge shotgun. He fired a shot through the windows of the police car and two shots over the roof, but... As the officers attempted to pin Ansel down in the bushes, a bullet, fired from Ansel's lever-action rifle, ricocheted off the top of the metal door and struck Sergeant Hewitson in the abdomen. His bulletproof vest hadn't been properly fastened. The bullet tore through a Velcro strap that should have been covered by a Kevlar panel. Sergeant Hewitson fell, bleeding out, he landed on top of the shotgun that he was wielding. Senior Constable O'Brien, who wasn't even wearing a vest, dodged further gunfire and rolled his bleeding colleague off the shotgun, reloaded it, and returned fire. Quote, I realised unless the TRG arrived, I could run out of ammo, in which case I would have to retreat with the others. I loaded two more rounds, looked up, and I saw the gunman was wriggling forward. That was when I heard a sound like a match being struck just past the right side of my head. End quote. Then, enter the cavalry. The TRG troop carriers came hurtling down the highway. The first driver hit the brakes and swerved at the sound of the gunfire. The four-wheel drive rolled when the second car smashed into the back of it unable to stop in time. Ansel seized on the moment. He got up on one knee and began lining up the police officers who were trying to crawl out of the wrecked vehicles. Senior Constable O'Brien had a clear shot and he didn't hesitate. The autopsy showed 33 entry wounds and grazes to Ansel's body. Senior Constable O'Brien had pumped him clean in the chest with a shotgun cartridge. Two wounds were fatal. One shot had ripped straight through his aorta. Ansel fell face down in the dirt. 
and Sergeant Hewitson was also declared dead after being rushed to the Royal Darwin Hospital. Ansel's missing partner, Miss Hewson, handed herself into the Queensland Police just four days later. Now, strangely, evidence arose that Ansel clung to the back of a road train and actually managed to escape the roadblocks, but then returned to confront the police officers at the roadblock that he'd successfully managed to escape through. This fueled a question that would never really be answered. Why would a skilled bushman give up his ticket to freedom and return to gun down police officers when he could have just as easily slipped away? Now, it was no secret that the 44-year-old buffalo hunter and grazier was quite bitter at the way life had turned out. Writer Robert Milliken, who spent time with Ansel while working on projects in the Northern Territory, said that Ansel never saw a penny for the myth surrounding his tangled life, despite being the inspiration for the main character in Crocodile Dundee. Ansel blamed his troubles on the federal government program to wipe out wild buffalo, his livelihood, to eradicate tuberculosis from the cattle industry. He had told reporters that he was living on unemployment benefits and, quote, bush tucker. Magistrate Wallace heard Ansel also believed that police and the government were just straight out against him. In his coronial ruling, Magistrate Wallace said that the contrast between the, quote, original Crocodile Dundee, who had appeared on television and wowed the country with his antics out bush, and the emaciated drug addict, who weighed just 53 kilos or 115 pounds when he opened fire on the police, couldn't be more vastly different. His drug abuse rendered his mind so addled that he believed fantasies that a child would dismiss with contempt. His pointless and destructive actions caused immediate agony and suffering to the men that he wounded and the families that he left behind. The infamous rampage means that Rod Ansell is remembered in Darwin and the top end of Australia not as a knockabout bushman, but as the methed out psychopath that murdered a heroic cop. Having a barbie boy at the river With no one else around A tropical honeymoon Knocking a 4X down She was standing in the water Eating a pumpkin scone When <coughs> Splash She was gone And they were doing the crocodile roll The woman and the reptile Doing the crocodile roll In the middle of the river Down came a husband with a gun and a carving knife To slaughter every crocodile for taking his darling wife You, 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 you can't, can't go around, around eating Queenslanders Overgrown go, uh, go at it, I'll, I'll turn you all into shoes <coughs> Splash, it was in the news And they were doing the crocodile roll The husband and the reptile doing the crocodile roll in the middle of the river, down came his bloodhound With mangy curly hair, picked up the scent, away he went, arse in the air Then the dog got carried away, and ran out on a log When, <coughs> guess what, no more dog, and they were doing the crocodile roll The canine and the reptile, doing the crocodile roll the middle of the river Down came a wild pig Rooting all about The little swine drank the wine And really pigged it out Then the crocodile chased him round Then the little pig said Up yours 
you know, another Crocs jewels, and I were doing the crocodile roll. The porker and the reptile doing the crocodile roll. In the middle of the river, there's no moral to the story. Just a brand new dance. Grab your partner by the neck and swing your crocodile pants. Dip your toe in the water. Are you ready for romance? Swirl your tail around the floor. Come on, take a chance. Now you're doing the crocodile roll. Stirring up the mud, doing the crocodile roll. In the middle of the river, they were doing the crocodile roll. Stirring up the mud crabs, doing the crocodile roll. In the middle of the river, 